This is a reading by Margaret Walker, recorded for the American Audio Prose Library in February of 1991 in Columbia, Missouri, where the author was in residency during Black History Month at the University of Missouri. Margaret Walker has lived in Jackson, Mississippi since 1949, where she was professor of English at Jackson State College until 1968, at which time she established and became director of their Institute for the Study of the History, Life, and Culture of Black Peoples, one of the earliest such centers anywhere, and the first of its kind in the South. During her long and distinguished career, Margaret Walker has published 10 books, including five volumes of poetry, one volume of essays, a biography of Richard Wright, and her epic novel of the Civil War, Jubilee. Among her many awards and honors are the Ford, Rosenthal, and Fulbright Fellowships, the Houghton Mifflin Literary Fellowship, and perhaps most notable, the Yale Series of Younger Poets Award, which she won in 1942 for For My People. With this volume, Walker became the first American black woman to win a major literary prize, and For My People itself was the first book of poetry published by a black woman since 1918. Margaret Walker was born in 1915 in Birmingham, Alabama. Her father was a Methodist minister and her mother a musician. When she was in her teens and living in New Orleans, Langston Hughes read some of her poetry and instructed her parents to get her out of the South so that she could develop as a writer. Accordingly, they sent her to Northwestern University, and after graduation, she worked for the WPA in the Chicago area for three years, joining the Southside Writers Group through her friendship with Richard Wright. This was a close working relationship that lasted for several years until a very bitter breakup, the subject of literary gossip and speculation for years, which Walker finally documented in her biography, Richard Wright, Demonic Genius. In 1939, she went to graduate school at the Iowa Writers' Workshop, eventually returning to take the PhD in 1965 with the draft of Jubilee as her dissertation. In the meantime, Walker also married, and she and her late husband are the parents of four children. Margaret Walker began work on the manuscript of Jubilee in 1934 during her senior year in college. But she says it really began in the promise she made long before that to her maternal grandmother, who is Minna in Jubilee, to tell her mother's story. Informed by impeccable and exhaustive research to corroborate the wealth of oral history on which it's based, Jubilee is unique in that it tells a story of slavery, the Civil War, and Reconstruction from the black perspective. It's also beautifully written and deeply informed with Walker's poetic gifts, all of which will be apparent in the following passages, which are taken from throughout the scope of the novel. I'm reading from my novel, Jubilee. Bari was two years old. Mammy Suki had been keeping her as she kept all master's bastards till they were big enough to work. She and brother Ezekiel had nearly a two mile walk bringing Bari to see her dying mother, Heather. Brother Ezekiel was a powerfully built stovepipe black man. He was neither young nor old. He was the plantation preacher, at least among the slaves. He could read and write, but the white folks did not know this. Now as he came along with Barry on his shoulders and Mammy Suki walking behind, he was humming a song. Soon one morning death come knocking at my door. When they got to Sis Hedda's cabin door, Aunt Sally met them. She was still in her voluminous apron, had her head rag on, and she went inside with them. Jake was sitting inside with a little black girl on his knees. Her eyes looked big as saucers in her thin face, and she had her thumb and two fingers in her mouth, sucking on all three hard as she could. Granny Ticey, Aunt Sally, Brother Ezekiel with Barry in his arms, and Mammy Suki all stood around Heather's bed. 
Jake had not moved from his corner, but he sat where he could look behind the quilt. Granny Tysey spoke first. Hera? Hera, here's Brother Zeke with the diary. He done brung your young'un to you. But the sick woman seemed in a stupor and hard to arouse. Brother Ezekiel moved forward while Aunt Sally and Caroline stood on both sides of the bed. And while Granny Tysey propped Hedda's head higher, the other two women lifted her up just as Brother Ezekiel held the child down over her and spoke afar. Says Hedda, here's Byri. Mammy Suki stood aside, a wizened old crone with a red rag on her head and her arms akimbo. Now the urgency in Brother Ezekiel's voice seemed to rouse the dying woman. Her eyes flickered and her lips moved. She put up her bony hands and fluttered them like a bird. A scarcely audible and muffled sound came from her lips. Then with great effort she spoke, raspy and indistinct, but clear enough for them to know she was saying, Barry, Brother Ezekiel held the child down close to her mother's face and said soothingly, It's your mama, Barry. Say hello to your ma. The child spoke, Mama, and then she whimpered. Hedda fell back on her pillows, and Ezekiel handed the child to Mammy Suki, who quickly took her outside into the night air. After a moment, Brother Ezekiel spoke again to the dying and exhausted woman. Says, Hedda, I'm here, Brother Zeke, it's me. Can I do something for you? Pray, she rasped, pray. He fell on his knees beside the bed and took her hand in his. The night was growing darker. Despite the full moon outside spilling light through the great oak and magnolia trees, inside Granny Ticey had lighted a large tallow candle. It flared up suddenly, and eerie shadows searched the corners and crowded the room. Brother Ezekiel began to pray, Lord God Almighty, you done told us in your word to seek, and we shall find. Knock, and the door be open. Ask, and it shall be given when your love come twinkling down. And Lord, tonight we is a-seeking. Way down here in this year, rain-washed world, kneeling here by this bed of affliction pain, your humble servant is a-knocking and asking for your loving mercy and your tender love. This year, sister is tired of suffering, Lord, and she wants to come on home. We ask you to roll down that sweet chariot right here by her bed, just like you done for Lysha so she can step in kind of easy-like and ride on home to glory. Gather her in your bosom like you done Father Abraham and give her rest. She weak, Lord, and she weary, but her eyes is a-fixin' for the light on them golden streets of glory and them pearly gates of God. She begging for the set at your welcome table and feast on milk and honey. She wants to put on them angel wings and wear that crown and them pretty little golden slippers. She done been broke like a straw in the wind, and she ain't got no strength. But she got the faith, Lord, and she got the promise of your almighty word. Lead her through this wilderness of sin and tribulation. Give her grace to stand by the river of Jordan and cross her over to hear Gabe blow that horn. Take her home, Lord God. Take her home. Mammy Suki had said that Aunt Sally would look after Byrie. And now, after three years, her words were still fresh in Byrie's memory. Aunt Sally's loving care was that of a mother hen clucking over one biddy. 
After that terrible time of sleeping in the big house, Barry found Aunt Sally's cabin the next best thing to the cabin she had shared with Mammy Suki. Despite the fact that it was bare and rough, and at night lying on the, her pallet, she could peep through the holes in the top of the roof to look at the stars. When it rained, they were careful to put cans and pots to catch the water and not to let themselves get soaked in the wet places. But it had an open fireplace, and most times they were warm, especially after Aunt Sally hung quilts over the rough shuttered window and the door. At night when they closed that door, it was like going off into another world that was grand and good. Barry was so devoted to Aunt Sally, she would never have told anyone how often she saw her steal great panfuls of white folks' grub and how many pockets she had in her skirts and her bosom, where she hid biscuits and cakes and pie, even though Big Missy had threatened more than once to have Aunt Sally strung up and given a good beating if she ever caught her stealing. Once safe in the cabin, they would fill their stomachs full of good food, tittering over the thought of how many different kinds of fits Big Missy would have if she knew how she had been outsmarted. Half whispering and giggling, Aunt Sally would pull out of her apron pockets and in her bosom, and they would eat hot biscuits from Big Missy's supper table. She'd die a unnatural death if she knowed I'm eating her biscuits. Livers to string me up and whip me, huh? I ain't cooking nothing I can't eat myself. Then Aunt Sally would undo all the rags wrapped tightly around Barry's hair and comb the sandy hair into curls, delighting the little girl's heart beyond measure, although her grave little face peered at herself through a cracked old glass, seeing bluish gray eyes that dared twinkle only the slightest bit. Most of all, Barry loved the stories Aunt Sally would tell about who she was and where she came from and what life was like and how to live in the big house and get along with Big Missy. My ma come here from South Carolina, and that's where I was born That She come here way back when Marsh John's grandpappy and his pappy first come to Georgia and settled in this year wilderness. Was nothing but engines and woods and vigorous wild animals here then. I was nothing but a teensy weensy youngin, too little to do nothing but hang around my mammy's dress tail. Every morning she brung me with her to master's kitchen to fix vittles for Marsh John's pappy's family. That was when engines was sure enough bad in Georgia, and wasn't no white folks safe out in their doors without their guns. Marsh John's pappy fought in the Revolution Freedom War with General George Washington, and when he come here to Georgia, they give him a bounty for being such another good soldier. For the war, he live in Virginia, where his folks come from, and then they come to Georgia. First off, they live in Savannah. That's where Big Missy come from. But when the United States government passed the territory law, Georgie opened up this year back country to so soldiers to settle. I disremember when. That's when Marsh John's pappy come to Lee County to the land drawing, and they've been a prospering all the time ever since. And that's how come I've been living in Marsh John's kitchen. How long I've been here? The Irish question tickled, and Sally and her fat side shook with her laughter. You just not come in the world. That's how long you been here. You was born in one of these very cabins on this here place. You was born in the hot summertime when the corn was all tasseled and the cotton bowls was green. And you come here before the stars fell. I seen the stars fall out in the sky with my naked eyes. They fell with a long tail of fire. And they fell that very fall before you was born. Your mammy died just before the panic struck, and Mars John couldn't get nothing for his cotton. That was right after your mammy died. I thought the world was coming to an end when the stars fell out in the sky, 
And when the panic come, they run the engines out in Georgia with guns. And they fit and fout and fit all over these here swamps, clean down in Alabama and them Florida swamps for them engines give up for surrender. Ain't been no passel of time, no how. Seemed like just yesterday. And sis Hedda, your mammy, was walking around here. Granny Ticey was the granny for you and Miss Liam. And I remembers just as good how there wasn't no time before we seen how white you was with that there sandy hair and had a, a right jet black woman. Marsh John turned right red when he seen you. And Big Missy, she went to have one of her crying and storming fits and throwing things. And, and, and then they said they got to take you away from Jake and Hedda, else Jake gonna kill you. That's how come they give you the Mammy Suki. And that's how come you's in the big house now. But Aunt Sally, I don't see how come that make Big Missy hate me so bad. I ain't done nothing. I knows you ain't child, and she knows you ain't done nothing neither. But she mad with your mammy and your pappy, and she mad with master because they done accused him of being your daddy. Now, I reckon I ain't got no business telling you, but since you asked me, you keep it to yourself and stay out in her way. That's all you does, stay out in her way. One of the largest dinner parties Barry remembered in the big house was a big political celebration for Marsh John. Some of his friends were coming from the state legislature. Even a congressman from Washington was expected and planter friends from seven counties. Barry was a big girl now and could do anything Aunt Sally wanted, but there was extra help for the feast. Jake's gal, Lucy, was also going to help. Caroline and May Liza were in charge of washing all big Mrs. fine crystal claret and sauterne glasses and water goblets and all the different things you needed in order to serve whiskey and brandy. Sam, the carriage driver, was also butler and in charge of fixing drinks for Marsh John's perpetual aid drinking company. He would stand resplendent in his fine black swallowtail coat and scarlet vest and gold buttons and open the heavily carved oaken door and announce the guest. And he would also keep the trays of glasses in a steady trot without spilling a drop. The preparations in the kitchen seemed endless. Aunt Sally was making patty shells to fill with creamed chicken. Barry and Lucy cleaned oyster forks and polished silver trays and salt cellars and toothpick holders and carried boxes of candles for Big Missy to count for the gleaming chandeliers and wall sconces. There must have been thousands of the homemade wax lights because the whole place was shining from the gleaming wood and red velvet portieres and scarlet carpets to the brass fixtures and the rose and teak wood furniture. There were game and mutton to be served with all their attendant sauces and jellies and special pickles and con conserves. Sometimes when there were so many underfoot and Sally would ha could hardly turn, she would lift her big cooking spoon out of a scalding hot mixture and she would scream and say, Scat! and everybody scattered. Barry kept wondering how she could see and hear the festivities way back in the kitchen. And she wanted to see the company arrive and see how they looked. And Sally told her to step outside the back door and stand in the dark under the big oak tree and watch them come up to the door. 
As each black barouche drawn by four horses stopped before the mansion, the great ladies and gentlemen alighted and entered. The light of the flickering candle sweeping before the op beyond the open door, where Sam stood proudly ushering in the guest. Luckily, Vary and May Liza and Lucy were needed back and forth for duties in both house and kitchen, so Vary caught snatches of conversation too. What she did not hear, the other servants heard and rehashed afterwards in the kitchen and the cabins. Nobody was too interested in what the white ladies were talking about, but the men were different. They discussed the news and the crops and the weather, their slaves and the politics of the county, the state and the nation. It was this conversation that the slaves wanted to hear. It was for this they kept their eyes and ears open and their mouths closed. As Aunt Sally said, when the women's goes in the bedrooms and the other parlors to whisper and titter over a trifling bit of nothing, then the serious talk among the men begins. Well, Jeff, said Marsh John, how's crops down your way? Well, now, I reckon I can't complain. When you take into consideration the miserable weather we've been having down in my neck of the woods, I'd say crops are good. We've already sold 500 bales of cotton, and my negroes are still picking in the fields. But you remember how cold it was in the spring and how dry it was all summer. And then just at harvest time, it started raining so terrible. And even as early in the fall as September, we had that right cold spell. So I didn't rightly think we'd have a crop at all. But I've got one and a fine one. Corn as fine as any in the country. More than enough to feed all my mules and negroes through the winter. I'll have corn to sell. I've got my hay feed for my mules and thoroughbreds already put away. We've been planting peas too. And despite the dry weather, we had wonderful luck with the gardens. I reckon I can't complain. How's yours? Well, I haven't been to my other places yet, but I've heard from my drivers, and each one says I'll find the best crop at his place. You know how it is, every driver doing his best to outdo the others in handling the negroes and bringing up a good crop. I haven't had much trouble this year, but a lot of my negroes have, be have been sick. And sometimes last winter, as many as eight and ten a day were out of the fields, laid up and couldn't work or wouldn't work. I don't know which. But if the luck I've had here is any indication, it looks like a pretty fair year to me. You talk about corn, I know I've got a fine crop of corn. And my cotton is bringing the best price in ten years. Remember way back there in the panic when cotton was way down to nothing and everything you had to buy including boot black in the mark, the sacks were sky high. Well, I just do declare, if it hadn't have been for my good drivers, I reckon we would have come near starving. But this year has been good, a mighty good year, I'll say. How about you, Lee? I'm not in a position to say just yet. We haven't finished cutting oats. The rye is hauled in, and we're planting peas, peas too. Ought to be through in a couple of days but I might have shot up short of hands. I hired old cab from Barnum two days last week for his and his mule's feed, but the nigger didn't do one good day's work. I can't put any confidence in my negros for steady work any time I'm absent from the place. I haven't been able to find a driver tough enough to put the fear of God in the negros and hold him down. To give you an example, I just bought a negro boy named Hal for $325. He's about 45 years old and looks like he ought to be able to do a good day's work. I told my driver to put him to work in the low ground and for him to cultivate 40 acres of cotton and corn after he clears the land and then to help run the wagon. But the very first day the Negro come up sick, I found out I'd been cheated. He's suffering from running of the reins. My John broke in to say, I got a Negro here just like that myself. Name is Jake, and he has been one of my best stud niggers. Had been planning to sell him, but kept putting it off. Now he's got running of the reins. Then Lee continued, last January, all my niggers took down with awful bad colds and 
whooping cough and fevers. I thought they'd cough their insides out before spring when they suddenly got well. By that time, they had used up more tar and tar syrup and whorehound and rock candy and good whiskey than they're worth. I'll be lucky if I don't have to buy food. Speaking of provisions, just then, Sam, who had been standing listening for a while, walked into the room smiling and resplendent in his butler's uniform and said, dinner is served. of July celebration. Lee County was planning a hanging on the 4th of July when the two women convicted of murder would be made a public example. A gallows was built in the county prison yard where all the public could witness the execution and the holiday was chosen because it was the best time for all the people. Every able-bodied slave in the county was, by order of his master, forced to attend the hanging. Fourth of July was always barbecue day in Georgia, a day for political speeches and all kinds of festive celebrations. This year, the barbecue would be held on the courthouse grounds. Various planters' families would carry baskets of dinner to spread around on the grass under the trees like a picnic. Vary was busy preparing lunches and baskets for all those going from Marsh John's family. The plantation cook was in charge of dinner for the field hands. Big Missy and Marsh John had generously ordered extra rum and tobacco for the slaves, and they were going to make a barrel of sweetened water for the slave children. Barry told Caroline and me, Liza, it makes me sick to my stomach every time I thinks about it. How you reckon we will swallow over our hanging? On the appointed day, however, the huge milling crowd generated an explosive excitement. The courthouse was decorated with bunting and small fat flags, and there were lots of benches placed out under the trees. Large stands were erected so that people could sit and look over the fence into the prison yard where the hanging was going to be. The gallows was ready, made of new pine lumber with heavy new rope and a trap set in full view of everyone. Up in the trees were perched a number of poor whites, chiefly boys and young men who heckled the crowd calling out obscenities and insulting jokes. Barry sat in a dull stupor with the other members of Marsh John's household retinue. Although they arrived early, around 10 o'clock in the morning, they found others who had been there long before, some since sunrise. The, con the country wagons kept rolling into town from all parts of the county until after 12 o'clock. Some of the white women, wives of poor dirt farmers, were in their best bonnets, but many of the planter families were represented by the men only. Barry looked out at the motley throng of people clothed in bright checkered colors. There were hawkers in their colored shirts, red suspenders and gaiters, with lots of baubles to attract the children whose parents could afford to buy. There were scattered groups around different activities. In one group, she could see a cockfight. Another had a gander pulling. Men fighting were gouging eyes for a prize. Lots of horse trading was going on over odds and ends of junk. And even a small auction took place on the courthouse steps. Now and then, she saw slave traders moving among the crowds 
whispering bargains into the ears of slave owners. Seated on the rude benches, many people were eating goober peas, and the old toothless women smacked their lips over various tidbits and gorged their underlips with sweet snuff. Most of the white people seemed to be enjoying themselves in the holiday atmosphere and were in high laughing spirits. With the exception of small black children who could not comprehend the day's doings, the Negroes were for the most part silent. They sat stiff and stolid, their faces morose, their bodies tensed. Grimes and his guards, like all other drivers, were very busy checking their crowd and keeping their slaves herded together. They made it impossible for them to escape because they kept each group ringed with armed guards. Firecrackers were popping from early dawn. Most of the fireworks were homemade from saltpeter and black gunpowder. But there were rumors that after the hanging, there would be a big display of new and store-bought fireworks in harmony with the patriotic nature of the day. It was a churning crowd, noisy and raucous and partly under forced control. There was nevertheless a current of tension running through the subdued mass of people. There were women in huge bell-bottomed and hoop-ringed skirts and close-fitting bonnets. There were dandies in tight-fitting pants and high hats. The slaves wore their usual homespun and linsey, some with straw hats flopping in the air as they walked. Many of the women wore red head rags. The children were barefoot, wearing a ragged shift and nothing else. Old men wielded canes as weapons of protection. All the socializing was confined within each group. They did not mix. The poor whites clustered together. The rich planter families sat alone. The Negro slaves were huddled under the watchful eyes of overseers and guards. What small camaraderie existed was within each separate unit. There was absolutely no bantering back and forth. Exactly on the stroke of 12 noon, the judge came out in his black robes, and with him the preacher, also in black robes, and the two women prisoners in chains between their guards. They appeared on a high platform in the prison yard. With them also were county officials. The hangman sat like a hawk, perched on a stool, also wearing the blackest black. Judge Winston presided. The whole affair was a formal occasion. After addressing the dignitaries and the crowd, he said, we are gathered here on this 80th anniversary of the birth of our great country to celebrate another milestone in our history. We are also gathered to perform a painful duty in the course of justice and before all men. A very fine program has been prepared for your edification and an eminent theologian has consented to bring us the sermon for this occasion. Before he begins to speak, however, we will be favored with a musical selection by a local artiste who will sing for us, Flee as a bird to your mountain. This was a song very loved, but the plaintive minor notes and words fell on deaf ears like so much gravel on rock or slate or tin. Her personal agony had begun. She could not bear to look at the women in shackles nor at the gallows or the hangman, much less the preacher with his oily face or the judge in his official robes of justice. Now he was introducing the speaker. Barry promptly forgot his name, but as long as she lived, she knew she would never forget the sermon of that preacher. I opened the book of Holy Scriptures to the fourth book of Moses called Numbers, and I choose for my text the words of that eternal law concerning murder. He thundered the word so loudly that it reverberated into the distance like an echo. Whoso killeth any person, the murderer shall be put to death. 
This is the eternal word of God. And God cannot lie. The murderer shall surely be put to death. I want to direct my few remarks to three separate groups. I want first to speak to the planters who are masters of African slaves. My friends, I speak to you leading farmers of Lee County as your humble servant. I admonish you in the name of the Lord and the fear of God to guard your property with your lives. Remember, your slaves are your sacred property. They are committed to you as a sacred trust from God. Read in his holy word where he tells you that your bond servants are yours and you are responsible for them. You are morally obligated to teach them right from wrong. You must constantly tell them the awful consequences of evil doing and the heavenly rewards for obedience and faithful service. God does everything well and for a purpose. Since the beginning of civilized man, there have been slaves and masters and there always will be. Slavery is a natural and righteous state. It is the civilizing principle of all great societies, yours is the God-given right to admonish your slave in the fear of the Lord, to punish him when he does wrong, and to teach him of the heavenly rewards after death that God has in store for him when he is your faithful, humble, and obedient servant. The Christianizing of the black heathen is your sacred duty. He was brought to these great shores for a Christian purpose. It is your duty to see that this great and sacred purpose is fulfilled, that the savage becomes a docile, faithful, humble, and obedient servant. Barry could not help but think how differently Brother Ezekiel preached at the Rising Glory Baptist Church but she did not want to miss a word. And now I turn to you black slaves. You are fortunate to have found Christian masters and to be cared for by these wonderful gentlemen. They protect and feed and clothe and shelter you. You must reward them with faithful service and strict obedience. You must obey the laws of Moses when he says, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not lie. Do you know what these commandments mean? Do you know what will happen when you kill, when you steal, and when you lie? I will tell you, God says he is a God who will never forget the disobedient. He will punish you and your children, and your children's children, all your little black pickaninnies down to the third and fourth generations. But he will have mercy on them that keep his commandments and obey him. When you steal from your master's crib, when you steal from your master's smokehouse, when you steal from your master's table, God sees you, and God does not forget. God sees you, and God will surely punish you. So niggas, stop stealing. Stop stealing from your masters. Stop stealing and stop lying. And woe be unto him that is a murderer. The murderer shall surely be put to death. And remember what the word of God says to you, slaves, servants. Obey in all things your masters. God meant for you to have masters. God meant for you to be slaves. God meant for you to be humble, obedient, honest, truthful, and God-fearing servants of your earthly masters. If his words were having effect on his black listeners, you could not tell from looking at them. 
Barry looked around her, and like her own poker face, saw her expression mirrored in her fellow sufferers. Not a slave turned a hair. Now the preacher began to wake himself up into a frenzy. And finally I speak to you, you awful sinners, you guilty of the terrible sin of murder. I turn to you in the name of God and I beg you to repent. Repent before it is too late. Prepare to meet your maker. May God look down into your evil black hearts and make the devil unfasten his hold on your souls before you burn forever in that eternal hellfire and brimstone prepared from the beginning of the world for such as you. God is a just and righteous God. God is an awful jealous God. God is a God of vengeance, but God will also have mercy on you black sinners. So I beg you to confess your sins and repent while there is still time. You cannot be spared the punishment for your awful crimes, but for your sins, God alone will have mercy on you that you could be so ungrateful, so evil and black-hearted and low down that you could commit crimes so enormous against your best friends on earth, against your masters, your dearest protectors, your Christian benefactors and your kind guardians that you should take their lives is a terrible thing. But terrible as it is, I implore you not to go into eternal hell and brimstone to burn forever in the pit of the devil's hell fire without saying you are sorry. Say you are sorry. Don't commit your souls to eternal damnation without repentance. Just say one time you are sorry and beg God to have mercy on you. Do you have nothing but hearts of stone? Are you nothing but cunning serpents? Are you nothing but ugly black beasts, proud of your abomination and your sin? God, look into your evil black hearts, and God will be sorry that you have got to die for being murderers beyond the pale of redemption, and may God have mercy on your low-down souls. But the waste of the day remained the ordeal of the two women. As the time approached and the hangman moved to take his perch, the tension in the people grew so great it was unbearable. A youth perched in one of the tallest trees shouted, kill the black bitches, hurry and kill them. That's what we come here for. The crowd murmured as the ugly suspense mounted. One of the women was stony faced and silent. When they unfastened her chains, and led her up the steps to the gallows. Her lips were set and her face was grim, but she said nothing. She did not even answer the words of the preacher, nor the jailers, nor the questions of the curious who heckled her. Without any black cap or covering over her face and head, the noose was fastened around her neck and tightened, and she was throttled with her eyes popping and bulging and her tongue forced out and hanging in plain view of the crowd. This completely unnerved the other woman, and she became hysterical. She screamed and jerked herself and sobbed and kicked against her jailers and struggled against the strong arms of the guards. Ain't done nothing to be sorry for. Ain't sorry. Ain't sorry for nothing. Ain't done nothing to be sorry for. Ain't, I tell you, ain't. Ain't done nothing. There were some who declared that they actually heard the women's necks pop as they fell through the trap, but this might have been a gross exaggeration. Under the stress of the moment, one could hear almost anything. Barry was shaking and shuddering, and her teeth were clattering in her head. She put her face in her hands and prayed. Bedlam broke loose. Black children screamed and cried. Women fainted. But on the faces of some of the men and boys, there was an unnatural look, neither human nor sane, a look of pleasurable excitement, a naked look of thrills born from cruel terror. There were long shadows when the guards and drivers began herding the slaves into the wagons. It was late afternoon, but hours before darkness. 
It would hardly be dark when they reached home, but there were lanterns and torches lit. The planters and their families had gone in baruch and carriage. Some of the drivers and their guards rode horseback, but the slaves were seated in tightly locked wagons. The long drive home was a silent ride. Some of the women were still nauseated, and since there was no top over them, they tried to hold their heads over the wagon sides and relieve themselves. All of them were shaken and disturbed. Whatever the motive had been in the minds of their masters to put on this monstrous show, one thing had been surely accomplished. The Negroes were frightened and sickened out of their wits. Barry was in one of the three crowded wagons going back to Marsh John's plantation. But like every other slave, she was alone with her own terrifying thoughts. Once they had driven into the yard and gotten out of the wagons, Grimes and his guards began checking them by names and cabin. Suddenly it flashed into Barry's mind that she had not seen Lucy all day. When Grimes called Lucy, Caroline spoke up quickly. She's sick. She in her cabin on her pallet sick. Last night she said she ain't go to Dick because she's sick. Who give her permission to stay home? I don't know, sir. I just remember her telling me that. Go there, Bob, speaking to one of the guards. Look in her cabin. Make sure she's sick and laying on her pallet. The guard went. Evidently, he saw a head under some rags and a body on a pallet, for he came back and reported to Grimes' satisfaction. But the next morning, they discovered that the head was a dummy. Lucy was gone. How long she had been gone, nobody knew. Whether she had had two nights and a day to get a good head start up the northern road was neither here nor there. Grimes took a posse of men and bloodhounds and went after her. But this time they did not bring her back. She had gone too far, and they could not find a trace. In desperation, Barry decided to go to Marsh John and ask his permission for her to marry Randall Ware. She planned to go when Big Missy was not around to influence his decision. She would go in the midst of this Christmas season while his heart was softened and his generosity at its height, when he would be mellow with brandy and whiskey and everything seemed to be going right on his plantation and therefore with his world. She picked a night when the slaves were having a big party and all around one could hear the fiddlers and the banjo picker singing, Oh Sally, come up, oh Sally, come down, oh Sally, come down the middle, while all the others joined in the singing and you could hear one voice louder than the others calling the rounds of the dancing. Evening to y'all, master. Barry spoke from the doorway, fumbling with her apron in her hands. Marsh John, startled, turned from his desk where he was wrestling with bills for merchandise and accounts with his drivers. He nearly let his book fall when he saw Barry. This white-looking, thin-lipped girl always managed to make him feel ill at ease. But he spoke in such a condescending tone 
and his usual patronizing fashion that she would never have known how much she disconcerted him. Why, good evening, Barry. Why aren't you over at the party dancing and having a good time? Don't feel like it, master. I ain't in no shape for dancing. Why, what's the trouble? Her eyes were on the floor before her, and she did not look at him when he, sp when he spoke. Are you sick or is something the matter? Yes, sir, there is something the matter. I don't know if you'd call it trouble, but in a way I'm sick, and in a way I ain't, and it's sure enough trouble for me. Marshawn turned all the way around in his chair now to face fiery. Well, if you don't tell me the trouble, I can't help you. What do you want me to do about it? She lifted her eyes then and looked him squarely in the eye. Master, I want your permission for me to get married. Oh, is that all? And he seemed relieved. I thought it was something serious. You mean you're going to have a baby? Yes, yeah, sir, that's what I mean. I'm big, all right, and I wants to get married. Well, now, that's no trouble. Lots of gals are getting married around here every day. How do you say, jump in the broom? And he laughed. But she did not crack a smile, and she remained silent. Between them, there arose a silent question. But Barry waited for him to speak first. By the way, who do you want to marry? Is it one of my boys around here, or a boy from a plantation somewhere around here? It ain't neither one. Well, if it's none of my Negro boys and none around here, who could it be? You don't mean some of these overseers or guards have been getting fresh with you, do you? No, sir. She looked up again and through narrowed eyelids with her face still solemn, she said, it ain't none of your boys around here. And it ain't no white man neither. This here man's black, but he free. If she had shot him, he could not have been more deeply shocked. His face turned pale as death, and he looked as if he had surely seen a ghost. For a full moment that seemed very long, he could not trust himself to speak. Barry looked at him and waited. You mean you are asking me to give you permission to marry a free issue nigger? Yes, sir. I is. He ain't a slave, cause he bond free. Do you know what that means? I reckon so, master. I reckon I does. Why don't you ask me for your freedom and be done with it? Now he spat out the words with such fury that Barry jumped as if he had hit her. Master, is you mad cause I asked you to let me marry with my child's own daddy? Now red with anger, he stood up and came close to her, leaving only a step or two between them, and his voice moderated to a low but urgent tone while his hands were raised as if in self-defense. You should have thought of this before you got a free-ish and nigger to get a child by. Getting a child by you don't make him own you. No, own the child. I own you, and I own your unborn child. When you ask me to let you marry a free ish and nigra, you ask me by the law of the state of Georgia to set you a mulatto woman free. And that's a mighty lot to ask. There's a big difference between asking to get married and asking to be set free. Why, I never heard of such in all my life. She drew back from him in fear as if he had hit her or might decide to do so. Suddenly she burst into tears, and looking up at him again with the tears on her face, she spoke cuttingly. Master, does you think it's a sin for me to want to be free? Her words were knifing him like a two-edged sword. He opened his mouth and his lower jaw sagged. A dull red moved again over his face and mottled the blood through his skin. Again, the silence between them cracked with tension they could feel. But he was master of his situation, and he knew it. 
He did not intend to let that mastery get away from him. But now he tried another tactic. He deliberately moved back to his desk and half sitting upon it, he crossed one leg and folded his arms. Then he looked steadily at her. So, that is what you wanted in the first place. And what do you think it would be like for you to be free? And where do you think you would go? Who would take care of you, feed you and clothe you and shelter you and protect you? What do you think it would be like to be free? She knew he expected her to say she didn't know. She started to speak the sober thought in her mind that her husband would do these things for her, but she knew he would consider her impudent, so she thought better of it and held her peace. When she did not answer him, he went on, Do you think you would be better off free than you are working for me? Look all around you at the poor white people who are free. You don't want to be like them now, do you? What is it you call them? Pobukra? They are free, free and white. But what have they got? Not a pot to piss in. Every blessed thing they get, they are knocking on my door for it. Can't feed their pot-bellied young'uns, always dying of dysentery and pellagra, eating clay because they're always hungry and never got a crop fit for anything no cotton to sell, and can't get started in the spring unless I help them. Do you think you would be better off if you were like them? And being black and free, why, my God, that's just like being a hunted animal running all the time. All over the South now, they're talking about making free issue niggers take masters and become slaves. They're not that much better off now anyway. Suppose that happened to your free issue nigger and you fell into the hands of a cruel master. Does anybody bother you here? Aren't you free to come and go as you please? Again, she did not answer. He was watching her as he talked and seeing the growing bitterness in her face, her tight lips, her jaws working grimly as she occasionally bit her lips and twisted her hands. He tried another tactic. I've often thought about setting you free. She looked up now at this, and he thought he caught the faintest gleam of hope in her surprised eyes. But here in Georgia, it's very hard to manumit a slave. You know what I mean, set you free. I don't have the right to break the law. I would have to have you taken out of this state, carried to a state like Kentucky, or Maryland, where the law permits a man to set his slave free if he wants to. Here in Georgia, manumission is only permitted as a great reward for saving a white person's life, and sometimes in great exceptions, when a slave has been very faithful, on the death of his master, he may be set free. When I die, you will surely be free. It's already in my will. Now the scorn in her face was quite apparent to him. He knew she did not believe him, and he was withered before her scorn. He had no additional weapon with which to fight such scorn, and he was forced to drop his eyes and hang his head. But when she still said nothing, he quickly brought this painful conference to an end. Now that is all. I'll have to ask you to leave. I was working on my accounts, and I'm very busy tonight. You'll have to excuse me. Dismissed, she turned with drooping shoulders and went out without saying another word. But now her hope was shriveled and dead within her. Her beautiful dream of freedom again seemed forever lost. Sitting alone in her cabin door with her own bitter thoughts, she heard music. In her mind, there was the bitter music of an acid little jingle. She had heard the slaves often sing among themselves. My old master declared to me that when he died, he'd set me free. He lived so long and got so bald, he give out the notion of dying at all. Over and over, the bitter jingle kept recurring to her. 
But the music she heard floating out on the balmy December air was another Christmas carol, also in keeping with the season and her thoughts. Oh, Mary, what you gonna name your newborn baby? What you gonna name that pretty little boy? This is now the second section of the book, Mine Eyes Have Seen the Glory. And the young master is in, this, in the army, and we see him here in combat and just before the battle in, in which he is injured. They were bringing up the big guns for battle. All day long the wagons were rolling. The roads across the mountain were crisscrossed with men and horses and heavy artillery. Johnny could see from his position in Pigeon's Gap how the September sunshine dappled through the thickly growing trees while on all the wide open spaces and fields around the dozen farmhouses were golden yellow. It was a sunny primrose scene that lay before him like a picture painted by a sun-drunken artist. In the heavily timbered areas, there was an impeding undergrowth of tangled vines and brush, not unlike the thickly growing vines and flowers that grew in his native section. Everything here was dry, however, dry as tinder, and ready to blaze into burning bonfires at the slightest touch of flame. Where he lived, on the other hand, the land was damp and marshy. There it was all low ground and wet swamp land with the rich alluvial soil in the river valleys of the Flint and Chattahoochee. Here the little stream known as Chickamauga Creek that meandered through the mountain was shallow enough to wade across. This was hilly, mountainous, and treacherous country, hard to move across and impervious as roads for animals, wagons, or men. These mountains were natural battlements and fortifications. They obstructed the view for the people in the valleys below. But on the mountain top, the view was wonderful. Johnny could look across Missionary Ridge and look out mountain yonder in Tennessee, then back again across Sand Mountain and Raccoon Mountain in Alabama, while here on the south bank of this West Chickamauga Creek, he was guarding the northern gate into his beloved Georgia, and the vistas were breathtaking. It was as if he stood on top of the world, astride his beautiful horse, riding the crest of the sky like a young sun god fighting a phaeton. With the rays of the sun highlighting his brown hair, and the earth spread before him in the low valleys like a golden brown and clay red bordered carpet. The people in the plains looked like tiny black and red insects scurrying back and forth for food and drawing up their lines for ant battles. Even the shiny black rails of the railroad trains chugging and puffing into Chattanooga were toy tracks and seemed of no importance from this immense distance. Those railroads crisscrossing through the mountainous terrain were the supply lines, however, for General Bragg's and General Rosecrans' armies. And they went east to South Carolina and Virginia, west to St. Louis, Missouri, north to Illinois and Ohio, and south to Alabama and Georgia. Johnny was 22, and he had found the whole meaning of his life in this war. He had come through Antietam and three subsequent raiding parties with Wheeler without so much as a scratch. He had led such a charmed battle life that he felt himself almost invulnerable. He was accustomed to the din of battle, 
the smoke and fire, the terrible noises of the horses and guns. In fact, the flashing guns exhilarated him, and he felt the blood racing hot in his face. He came alive on the battlefield. He always kept a cool head, and he was alert in all his movements. In a way, he felt himself unusually fortunate. He was born into a class of men who naturally took the role of leadership in this war. As an aristocrat, he had been schooled from childhood for military combat. As a graduate of West Point, his colonelcy had been literally assured. He was a rich southerner, so it was natural that his sword and his horse felt easy in his hands. His body servant, Jim, looked after all his menial and physical necessities. His horse, Beauty, had withstood the baptism of fire on the battlefield and seemed undisturbed by the thundering guns belching fire and black smoke. Aside from his mother, he had no sentimental attachments to distract him from his duty and the business of this war. He could handle his Colt 44 with unusual skill and effectiveness. He was savage when it came to killing the enemy. He had neither mercy nor compunction. The Confederacy must be maintained. The Southern states must secure their complete and unquestioned independence from the tyranny of the hated federal radical government in Washington. During the night, the battle lines were formed. And on the morning of September 19th, 1863, the fighting began. With a signal from Wheeler's cavalry, they moved forward in a rush with all of Bragg's army, plus steadily appearing reinforcements, slowly encircling Rosecrans' men, and almost from the beginning, forcing them back. At noon, there was a lull. But in the afternoon, the fighting began again in earnest. And for an hour, it was the most bloody and ghastly that Johnny had thus far seen. Despite the overwhelming numbers on the Confederate side and their improved position, the whole day passed with no special advantage gained. And that night, both armies slept on a blood-drenched battlefield. In the morning, his usual battle elation returned. During the night, Longstreet had come up with heavy reinforcements, and the courage of all the men was renewed. Johnny found his horse Beauty ready and waiting, and he rode forward thrilled by the Confederate colors that went before them. He heard the stirring sound of the drummers and the bugle corps, and he rode with the conviction that victory must reward such a righteous cause. At first, when he heard the sudden neighing of his horse, he thought it must be elsewhere. He felt the horse tremble under him, so he gripped the reins tighter. But simultaneously, he felt his beast give way to the ground under him while a sudden tearing pain burst through his right shoulder and the upper part of his back. The pain was both a knife and a fire and bewilderment numbed him while he tried to collect his faculties. Slowly he realized, as other horses rushed past him, that both he and his horse had met with an accident. He was hit, and beauty was also hurt. Somehow he did not quite understand how he managed it. He waited until the heavy rush of men and horses had passed by him. And in a death-like stillness, he found his feet and got off his horse. His beautiful animal was suffering, and obviously a leg was broken. He must shoot him at once and get him out of his misery. Placing the gun at the most vulnerable part of the beast's head, he closed his eyes and shot him. The horse gave one convulsion and lay still. Now Johnny's emotions were fourfold. He felt his eyes sting with tears he dare not shed for his dead horse. He felt chagrin and disappointment to be left behind the battle. He was revolted 
when he looked at the carnage around him. There were dead men sitting upright with eyes staring at him. For the first time in his life, he felt fear for his fate. How long must he wait here before the ambulance wagon could find him? How badly was he hurt? He felt a fullness in his chest and a choking of phlegm in his throat. But when he felt obliged to clear his throat and spit, he saw his sputum threaded and colored with blood. The tearing pain once it had sizzled through him had just as suddenly subsided. He tried to rest himself against the body of his dead horse and thus be still and protect his wound as long as possible. One morning, about the third week in May, Barry was in the kitchen cooking. When all the children came running to alarm the house, they could hear a noise like thunder, and the sky was black. Caroline and May Liza closed the upstairs windows against a possible thunderstorm. But as the rumbling noise grew louder and the black sky obscured the sunlight, they heard voices singing with drums and bugles sounding, and in a few minutes they saw that the black cloud was dust from the horses' hooves of a great army of men riding and singing. Hurrah, hurrah, we bring the jubilee. Hurrah, hurrah, the flag to make you free while we go marching through Georgia. They rode up to the steps. And in less than 15 minutes, soldiers and horses were overrunning the place. They came like a crowd of locusts. And the noise was so great that suddenly there was bedlam. Miss Lillian had only just finished dressing. And as Caroline said, I don't believe she ever got her shoes buttoned. And her hair was still hanging down her back in one long yellow plait like she went to bed. The commanding officer a major general came to the front door and knocked. When May Liza saw for the first time the Union blue uniform, she was so flustered and excited she kept curtsying and bobbing up and down saying, come in, sir, come right in, sir, and make yourself at home. He smiled and said, is your mistress home? Yes, yeah, sir, yes, yeah, sir. She'll be down directly. Uh, won't you have a seat in the parlor, sir? That's where gentlemen's generally goes. I'll wait here till she comes, thank you. Miss Lillian came down the long stairs slowly, her skirts trailing, her blue eyes looking more calm than stricken, and only her husky voice sounding a little startled. Good morning, sir. Good morning, madam. Are you the mistress of this place? Miss Lillian looked around as though expecting Big Missy to answer, and then again at the soldier, his hat in his hand. Yes, I get reckon I am. I'm the only one left. The only one left, he was puzzled of my family, my mother and my father, my husband and my brother are all out there. And she pointed vaguely toward the cemetery. He still looked puzzled. She hastened to say with more alertness than usual, but with no asperity, they are dead. He saw her agitation because she was wringing her hands. Now he fully understood. I'm sorry, ma'am. How many slaves do you have on the place? Slaves? Yes, servants. Oh, about five, I guess. Barry and Caroline and May Liza and Barry's children. I think the rest must have all run away. Well, madam, I'm ordered to have you, all your slaves, appear in the yard. And in the presence of you and the witnessing soldiers, hear me read the proclamation freeing them from slavery. Oh, her voice trembled only ever so slightly. Mr. Lincoln's proclamation? I told Mama he had set the slaves free. And then she turned toward the cord to ring the parlor bell. But seeing May Liza and Caroline standing gaping in the inner door, she called instead. Liza, call Byrie and tell her to get her children and you and Caroline come out on the porch. This gentleman has something he wants to tell you. 
Vary would never forget the scene of that morning on the front veranda as long as she lived. Miss Lillian stood in the door with her two children, Barb and Susan, and her arms were around their shoulders. Standing beside Barry were Caroline and Melaza, their faces working as though they were trying to look solemn while the man read the paper. Barry scarcely heard a word he said. It was all she could do to keep Jim still because he wanted to dance a jig before the reading was over. Minna stood quietly beside her mother, holding a corner of Barry's apron in her hand. And like Miss Lillian's children, she stared curiously at the soldiers. Barry caught snatches of the long document as the man's voice droned on, shall be forever free. And she was caught up in a reverie hearing that magic word. Could it be possible that the golden door of freedom had at last swung open? She mused further, watching the long lines of soldiers standing on Marsh John's plantation and still coming in long lines from the big road. And she was thinking there must be no end of them. Her ears caught the words. And I hereby enjoin upon the people so declared to be free to abstain from all violence unless in necessary self-defense. And I recommend to them that in all cases when allowed, they labor faithfully for reasonable wages. He was folding the paper before Barry realized that the tears were running down her face. Then she turned to go back inside to her kitchen and her cooking. Jim could restrain himself no longer. The 10-year-old little boy grabbed his 6-year-old sister and lifting her in his arms began to dance his jig and sing, You is free. You is free. Mella, you is free. You free as a jaybird sitting on a swinging limb. Jubilee, you is free. Jubilee, you is free. And Minna, who was puzzled but excited, smiled and tried to catch some of the contagion of her brother's wild spirits. She laughed and clapped her hands and said, Free? 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 I sit upon a hornet's nest, I dance upon my head, I tie a viper around my neck, and then I go to bed. I kneel to the buzzard, and I bow to the crow. And every time I wheel about, I jump just so. Wheel about and turn about and do just so. Every time I wheel about, I jump Jim Crow. Ku Klux Klan don't like no coons. The first morning Randall Ware worked in his shop after the expulsion of Negroes from the Georgia legislature. He had a caller. Ed Grimes appeared in the open space where Randall Ware was shoeing a horse and said, Nigger, do you own this land? Startled, Randall Ware looked up and caught his breath before answering. Mister, you are standing on my property. And if you doubt it, you can find the deed recorded in the courthouse. I didn't ask you for any of your impertinence. I've seen the records. Looks like you own nearly all the good land around here. I own a fair share of the land around Dawson. I happen to come by it honestly. Well, you got a piece I want to buy. Where is it? Grimes went to the grist mill adjacent to the blacksmithy and he pointed diagonally across the railroad tracks to the land he had in mind. I'm sorry, said Randall Ware, but it's not for sale. 
Nigga, are you telling me no? I'm saying I don't want to sell. Well, we'll just see if we can't find some way to make you change your mind. And with that, he turned on his heels and left the place. Randall Ware thought no more about the incident as the days passed and he was busy working in his shop. He learned from Henry Turner that the Negroes were going to appeal to Congress and beg to have Georgia removed again from the Union. But Randall Ware said he would have to stay near home for a while. His journeyman was afraid to stay on the property alone. It was late October and great masses of the Georgia people were more distracted than ever. For with the approaching presidential elections, there was high feeling between the local whites and the black Republicans. Negroes everywhere were being urged to vote the Grant Colfax ticket for the Republicans, while the conservative Democrats were stumping every section of the state for the Seymour Blair ticket. Randall Ware kept busy at his trade, but on the eve of the election, at Turner's insistence, he began attending more loyal league meetings and working to encourage local Negroes to hold fast to the Republican ticket. Sporadic spurts of violence were erupting around him, but since there had been no incidents in his immediate vicinity, Randall Ware was caught unaware one night on returning from a political meeting. He heard a crowd of horsemen riding up to his shop. He turned to face them the white-sheeted callers with their faces covered, and saw them throw at his feet the body of a man. It was Jasper, his journeyman. Pinned across his bloody chest was a piece of foolscap, also stained with his blood and with the crudely printed words, dead, damned, and delivered. Jasper had been shot in his right temple but evidently before they killed him, he had been brutally beaten with sticks, for his flesh was cut and bleeding, and his shirt was bloody and in shreds. Randall Ware was alone. He needed someone to help him with the body of poor Jasper. He first made a cry in the streets for help, but nobody came. Then he made a light in his house and went out again to find help. He had to walk about three quarters of a mile to a Negro community. When he returned with two men to help him, he found Jasper's body was gone, and his shop and the back room serving as his living quarters were in shambles. He thanked the two colored men who were wide-eyed with terror, and he told them he guessed he could manage alone. He would try to put his place to rights. At four o'clock in the morning, the riders came back again. He was again unprepared for violence and he made no attempt to run or try to escape. They grabbed him. Ware was a powerful man, and he struggled until he felt himself hit on the head with a blow that felt like iron. He lost consciousness, and when he came to himself, they had him in the woods. When he opened his eyes, he saw three men standing over him as he was lying on the ground. They came at him with blows about the head and face, and although they were disguised, he thought he recognized the voice of one who kept pounding and yelling, Nigger, who do you think you are? You think you're good as a white man, don't you? You think you're just as good going to the state house and dressing up like a white man and owning all our good land? Don't you know you ain't nothing but a nigger? We know just what to do with a big, black, ugly baboon like you when you get so uppity you too big for your nigger britches. Randall Ware wondered why they did not shoot him and kill him and get it over with. Why were they merely beating him? Did they mean to cut him to death and shoot him afterwards? Then he heard one whisper, why don't we kill him now? No. I said, no. He got all them papers in the courthouse, ain't he? How are we going to get that land if we kill him? Beat him an inch of his goddamn life, but don't kill him. It was broad daylight when they rode away on their horses. For a long while, Randall Ware lay on the ground, half conscious, bleeding, and so sore he could scarcely move. His lip was cut 
and he knew there was a bad cut over both eyes, and his face was swollen twice its size. He also had a large, painful lump on his head, and about his back and shoulders, they had beaten him with what felt like wooden clubs, but were actually stripped branches from the trees. He got to his knees, but when he tried to open his eyes, the blood ran down his face. He tried to stand and found he could not, so he began to crawl on his hands and knees out of the woods. It was late afternoon when he finally made it into his shop, and then he was so exhausted he fell on his bed to sleep. In the darkness he awakened and lighted a lamp. He began to care for the cuts and bruises on his face and head. When he heard such a loud commotion in the streets, he looked out and saw riders coming again. This time he would not wait. He quickly put out the lamp and ran into his grist mill. There he made his way to the great wheel that pulled the mill by water power. And lowering himself quickly, he dropped down into the water while holding to the rim of the half-submerged mill wheel. He was not a minute too soon. He heard their voices and knew they were in his shop and house again. They ransacked the place again and began yelling and cursing and calling his name. I told you we ought to kill that black bastard. We got to teach him a permanent lesson. How long can we waste time here looking for him? He ain't going nowhere. We can come back and get him later on. And they left. But Randall Ware, now deathly afraid, waited another full hour before he came out of his grist mill after hiding under the water and holding on to the great wheel that ran the mill. Early the next morning, he had another caller. This time, he would not answer, and he peeped out stealthily to see who it was. It was old Doc, and he was banging on the door. Let me in. It's only me, Doc. Let me in, Ware. I know you're in there. Randall Ware let the doctor in. At first, the black man glared at the white doctor, his swollen face and lip and half-closed eyes making him look like some half-mutilated animal. The blood was still on his head and face, and his body ached from the terrible beating. Looked like you had an accident. Yeah, I reckon so. Accident strictly on purpose. Well, you better let me take a look at you. You need a doctor. Is that why you came here? to offer me your doctoring services? Why not? I'm a doctor, am I not? And I don't think there's another one for miles around. Are you sure you weren't sent? Well, what difference would that make? You still need the doctor, don't you? Randall Ware grudgingly admitted that he did. The doctor went to work on his face and head and he flinched under the probing of the sore and cut places. At first, old Doc was strictly professional. Hmm, that's a bad one. You took a mighty bad beating, didn't I, though? Wonder why they didn't kill me. Oh, you know that answer as well as I do. On account of the land? Yes. Are you willing to sell now? Do you think I've got any choice? Not if you want to live and continue working here. And if I don't sell, I'd advise you to leave. But you would be a fool to leave everything you've got just because of a little piece of land. Sell the land. You'll get a fair price. Randall West snorted with a bitter-sounding grunt. The doctor worked a while longer in silence. And when I sell this piece, they'll want another and a bigger piece. And that will keep on till I don't have any left. Oh, I don't know about that. There's a limit to most people's greed. For money or for land? For votes or for power? Well, now you might as well give up the idea of power and voting. You're going to get yourself absolutely killed if you don't quit all political activity. I thought you came to bring me a message. I can carry back your answer if you desire. And if my answer is not what they like, well, I couldn't say what might happen. You might have night visitors again, and this time you might end up like your journeyman, Jasper. 
It's not necessary to go that far unless you don't value your life and property more than my liberty, more than your liberty. Well, I guess I had forgotten your role on the Dutton Plantation. You are a real humanitarian doctor at your service any time. Shall I tell them you will sell? I need some time to think about it. They won't be giving you much time. Yes, damn them, yes. Tell them I'll sell. Tell them I'll leave. Tell them I'll leave our politicking. Tell them to save my miserable neck, I'll cease resisting and desisting. Tell the hellish rebels I say yes. And he burst into a fit of oaths. He put his head down in his hands, and when his shoulders had ceased shaking, he looked up and found the doctor was gone. This is near the end of the book, when uh, Barry's first husband, Randall Ware, has come back, and she is supposed to make the choice between the two men, between Randall Ware and Ennis Brown. And uh, at the same time, she's very happy to see her boy go to school. But as it turns out, she's expecting another baby for Ennis, and when she thinks about it and compares the two men, she makes the decision that she will stay with him. All right now, said Barry, I'm sitting here. Well, I see you, don't I? I can't stand that vile language you's putting out. Oh, I forgot about that prissy old white woman who was mistress on the plantation where you come up. You ought to seen her. Did you ever see her? And Randall Ware turned his question to Ennis, who was struck dumb by all that was transpiring. And he shook his head no, because he was too dumbfounded to speak. Well, that old white woman looked and talked and acted like she was Queen Victoria. Big Missy, they called her. She reared all the niggers and white folks around her, just as prim and prissy as you please. She had a son who thought he was Prince Charming. I heard he was killed in the war. And she died, too. I wonder whatever happened to her stupid daughter that she bossed around when she was full grown. Who are you talking about? Asked Barry. Miss Lillian? Listen to her. Miss Lillian? And he mimicked poor Barry, who was shocked out of her wits to hear Randall Ware discuss her white folks in such sacrilegious terms. Yeah, that's the one, Miss Lillian. Whatever become of her? I told you she lost her mind, and I don't think it was one bit funny, neither. Well, what would you expect from somebody never taught one day in her life to look the truth in the face? How is she going to cope with real life when you pull the rug out from under her and she no longer can sit on a cushion and feed upon strawberries and cream? Well, what I started to say was, you couldn't have told that old white woman she wasn't fit to be an angel? She was a pious Christian lady, if ever I saw one, just as prim and prissy as you please. She left her prissy mark on everybody around her, including Barry. That's why she can't stand bad language. And so far as education is concerned, I tell you it may not be the only way for our people, but it is the main way. We have got to be educated before we know our rights and how to fight for them. All the violence and killing that colored people have suffered since freedom may just be a drop in the bucket to what they put on us in slavery time, but God only knows what it will be in the future. Well, all I got to say, Randall Ware, is I can't understand you no more than I can understand evil white peoples when ain't got no shame and ain't got no God. But I ain't gonna try to beat the white man at his own game with his killing and his hating neither. I know it's deep down in my heart that there is a God. 
And he ain't going to never forget his children. No more than I'm going to forget mine whilst I'm living in this world. He's above the devil too. That's what he is. I know I'm a child of God and I can pray. Things ain't never going to get too bad for me to pray. And I know too that the good Lord's will is going to be done. I has learned that much. I'm going to leave all the evil, shameless peoples in the world in the hands of the good Lord. And I'm going to teach my children to hate nobody, don't care what they do. I ain't going to teach my children hate, because hate ain't nothing but rank poison. I knows there's evil peoples in the world, and I knows everything don't always turn out like we think is right. But I also knows, like the song say, what we sings in church, a charge to keep I have, a God to glorify, a never dying soul to save, and fit it for the sky. You've been talking all day long now, and I've been listening. I knows how much hell the white man can raise, and I knows how much the black man can raise, and I expect hell ain't gonna have only white folks in it, and neither is there gonna be just colored folks up in heaven, because as the song says, Everybody talk about him ain't going there. And mighty few is bound to make it in. But down here in this year rainwashed world, we's all got trials and tribulations. We's all got to fight the devil and his wicked himself the devil. Poor colored folks ain't gonna have no more put on us than we is able to bear. We's done come through slavery and we is free at last. I knows we's got to wander a while in the wilderness it's like the children of Israel done under Moses. But when the battle's over, we shall wear a crown. I ain't gonna get tired of well doing cause I got shot glory one of these mornings when the wicked world is on fire. God don't promise to make our way easy. Jesus, I reckon, wore his crown of thorns. Ain't nobody knows the face of evil more than I does. You done call me a white folks nigger and throwed up my color in my face because my daddy was a white man. He wasn't no father to me. He was just my master. I got my color because this is the way God made me. I ain't had nothing to do with my looking white no more than you had nothing to do with your looking black. Big Missy was mighty mean to me from the first day I went in the big house as a slave to work. She emptied Miss Lillian's peapot in my face. She hung me up by my thumbs. She slapped me and she kicked me. She cussed me and she worked me like I was a dog. They stripped me naked and put me on the auction block for sale. And worstest of all, they kept me ignorant so as I can't read and write my name. But I closed her eyes in death. And God is my witness, I bears her no ill will. Old master was my own daddy and he never did own me for his child. I begged him to let me marriage with you and go free. And he said, no, he ain't punished nobody. When he stand to see them beat me, she stopped and looked at them frightened, almost panic stricken. For in waking herself up to this pitch, she suddenly realized that she had never told either one of them that she had been beaten. But they caught her words and suddenly they were both standing over her. What did you say? Asked Guinness. Who stood to beat you? Asked Randall Ware. Then both of them together said, when? Now Barry was crying. She realized she had gone too far not to go on. She was fumbling at her waist and her apron, at the buttons fastening her clothes. Suddenly snatching at her clothes, she tore them loose and bared her back. That's what they done to me that morning when I was trying to meet you at the creek. That's how come I got them there scars. Hysterical now, she had thrown off piece after piece of her clothing. And now in the moonlight, the two men stood horrified before the sight of her terribly scarred back. The scars were webbed, and her back had ridges like a washboard. Ennis Brown's face was wicked, and he covered his face to keep them from seeing him cry. He knew and understood now why Viry went wild when she saw him with a whip in his hand after Jim. Randall Ware was swearing terrible oaths and chorusing them with, oh no, my God, no. Oh no, my God, no. Look at what those bastards have done. Barry was still weeping, but just as quickly as she had torn off her clothes, she recovered herself. 
and threw her apron around her shoulders to cover her back again and began to draw her skirts closer. Now she was drying her eyes and trying to compose herself. I may not understand much. I'm just a poor colored woman traveling through this sinful world like Brother Zeke used to sing. I am a poor wayfaring stranger. I'm tossed in this wide world alone. No hope have I for tomorrow. I'm trying to make heaven my home. I want you to bear me witness. And God knows I tells the truth. I couldn't tell you the name of the man what whipped me. And if I could, it wouldn't make no difference. I honestly believe that if every one of them peoples what treated me like dirt when I was a slave would come to my door in the morning hungry, I would feed them. God knows I ain't got no hate in my heart for nobody. If I is and doesn't know it, I praise to God to take it out. I ain't got no time to be hating. I believe in God, and I believe in trying to love and help everybody. And I knows that humble is the way. I doesn't care what you calls me. That's my doctrine. I'm going to preach it to my children. Every living one I got, I ever hopes to have. It was after midnight. But they were too wakeful now to think about sleeping. Randall Ware knew from the moment he looked on Lyra's lacerated back that they could never go back to what had been before he left. It was too late. Ennis Brown knew that this woman, who had stood so much outrage, had a wisdom and a touching humility that he could never cease to admire. It was more than her practical intelligence or her moral fortitude, more than the fundamental decency and innate dignity that marked her character as an unusual one in the face of both these men that night. Randall Ware had hinted that she was a prudish woman, as though he had forgotten any moments of passion between them when he had controlled her and her face was neither impassive nor cold. But Ennis Brown knew that she was touched with a spiritual fire and permeated with a spiritual wholeness that had been forged in a crucible of suffering. She was in that night a spark of light that was neither of the earth nor September air, but eternal fire. Yet it was not that she stood there in pride for them to worship her or to be in awe of her deep integrity. She was only a living sign and mark of all the best that any human being could hope to become. In her obvious capacity for love, redemptive and forgiving love, she was alive and standing on the highest peaks of her time and human personality, peasant and slave, unlettered and untutored, she was nevertheless the best true example of the motherhood of her race, an ever-present assurance that nothing could destroy a people whose sons had come from her loins. The last chapter, Howdy and Goodbye, Honey Boy. Ryrie was moving around quietly in Jim's room, hoping not to disturb him. But then she felt his eyes on her and saw he was awake. Ma, yes, Jim, I sure hates to leave you, but I sure is glad to go to school. I knows, and I'm glad for you. I've been praying for a way to send you to school. It wasn't going to be easy to send you to town to school this winter and your pa needing you here on the farm. I knows. And he was saying he wasn't going to spend the money. Yeah, but he's going to miss you just the same. Much as he grumbled, it's going to be worse when he ain't got nobody to help him. Yes, um, I want you to promise me you is going to study hard and make us proud. Your daddy say he's going to make a teacher out of you. That's going to make me proud. I know more, and I'm going to study real hard. I miss Mena and Harry, too, and I don't know when I'm going to see all y'all again. 
If it's the Lord's will, it won't seem long before you is home again. Yes, am And Jim, I want you to be good and try to get along. Mind your manners and make friends with people. Friends and good manners will carry you where money won't go. You is born lucky, and it's better to be born lucky than born rich. Because if you is lucky, you can get rich. But if you is born rich and you ain't lucky, you is liable to lose all you got. But you got to use mother wit along with education, else you won't be nothing but a fool. Get up in the morning early and say your prayers. Early bird catches the worm. And don't you be mean and ugly in your heart toward nobody. Remember, sweet ways is just like sugar candy, and it catches more flies than vinegar. I'm praying for you to be somebody. I want you to be good and make a real man out of yourself. You has got a great big chance now. Don't mess it up. I'm sorry you ain't got no more fitting clothes, but your daddy say he can buy you some more in Montgomery on the way to, what you call that place? Selma. I ain't never heard tell of it before, but we's been trying to get to Montgomery ever since we left Georgia. I reckon this morning you's done be there. Yes, sir. I gotta be getting in my kitchen now and cooking. You get up now, clean yourself up, and put on them that clothes and straighten up this here room. I reckon this gonna be Harry's room now when you gone. Yes, am And Viry went out and closed the door. Margaret Walker's books are For My People, Ballad of the Free, Prophets for a New Day, October Journey, For Fairy Street Green, and This Is My Century, New and Collected Poems, All Poetry, Jubilee, a novel which is widely available in paperback, A Poetic Equation, Conversations Between Nikki Giovanni and Margaret Walker, Richard Wright, Demonic Genius, which is available as a Warner paperback, and How I Wrote Jubilee and Other Essays, available through the Feminist Press. The American Audio Prose Library is a comprehensive collection of distinguished American writers reading and discussing their work. For information about other writers in this series, including Alice Walker, Toni Morrison, James Baldwin, Ernest Gaines, Intasaki Shange, John A. Williams, and more than 100 others, write us for a free catalog at the address printed on the label of this tape, or give us a call on our toll-free line at 1-800-447-2275. This tape was produced for the American Audio Prose Library by Kay Benetti and Dave Taylor. Field recording engineer was Steve D'Onofrio. And our thanks to Professor Michael Middleton of the University of Missouri School of Law for his invaluable assistance. This project is made possible with financial assistance from the National Endowment for the Arts and the Missouri Arts Council.